You're muted. Good morning, good day, good evening, dear invited speakers, dear guests, dear colleagues, dear friends and interested participants, dear ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's webinar. Let me start with introducing myself. My name is Stefan Kachlis Mates, and I would be your facilitator of today's session. If I'm not doing what I'm doing right now, I'm the head of a project at GIZ, managing the Fund for International Agricultural Research, FIA. I'm agronomist by training and have been working for around 25 years, mostly on the African continent, to contribute to enhancing production, reduce hunger, increase income while protecting our natural resources. It is with mixed feelings that I'm moderating today's webinar. I'm very happy to have been chosen as a moderator for the second time, as I've been enjoying the first webinar and kept in mind, kept it in mind as a useful and relevant event. I have a less positive feeling as a trigger for this event is a much more thorough, sorrowful one. Food security has been in my focus for quite a number of years. And I was of the belief that I was that we have made relatively good progress in that area towards global food security, decreasing poverty, fighting hunger and malnutrition. But the recent years have shown that I may need to revise that appreciation and recognize the fact that our food systems are much less resilient than I would have hoped for. Not only that shocks of various nature have been, have shown that food systems are more fragile and the impact of war is felt by those who shouldn't. Therefore, this webinar comes at an appropriate time and brings together speakers and participants to join minds and forces to positively address the situation. The challenge is big and no one alone can face it. This webinar should be regarded as part of a series of webinars that brings us together to think through important topics related to international food systems and the interface between science and policy, as well as for advocacy and for enhanced collaboration. Therefore, we would like to hear from you to participate in our question and answer session that will follow the speakers and the presenters' remarks. Please submit your questions on IFPRE.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using our hashtag at AskIFPRE on Twitter. In today's webinar, we have representatives of the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ, the African Development AFDB, the Global Partnership for a Food Secure Future, CGR, the World Food Program and the Shamba Center with us. The webinar entitled Addressing the Global Food Security Crisis, Strengthening Research and Policy Responses is planned to unfold in four sessions. We will be setting the scene by looking at the implications and possible responses to the global food security crisis. This will be followed by a presentation on how internal international agricultural research support can address short, medium, and long-term responses. On the same scene with the research as one relevant actor, we will invite speakers and stakeholders to give their comments on how the bridge to practice can be built. I'm sure that this would trigger thoughts, ideas, comments, additions, responses, questions from the audience, and those can be posted, as I said, in the chat and compiled to the speakers to react. Now, to set the scene, I would like to call on Martin Frigene, who is the Director of Agriculture and Agro-Industry at the African Development Bank, AFDB. He's a trained geneticist and has been working in international agricultural research in various positions. He dedicated some central time of his life to cassava. This is an important crop contributing to the food security in many parts of the world. And I have known him personally as a chief technical advisor to the Ministry of Agriculture in Nigeria, who is now the president of the African Development Bank. His intervention will be followed by a recorded contribution by Sebastian Lesch, who is the head of division for sustainable agriculture, supply chain, international agricultural policy, agriculture and innovation at the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ. 
The flagship project, Green Innovation Centers, is part of this portfolio, as well as the support to international agricultural research. As a, and as a historian with a focus on international politics and international law, he experiences with his experiences in Egypt, Central Asia, and Southern Caucasus, and previously spokesman of BMZ, he knows about the importance of addressing the issue at the appropriate time. Sebastian Lesch, as I said, will be, present, or will be presenting on a video, but he would be complimented and we will have his colleague Felicitas Rudig with us for the closing session and to take up some of the questions arising. Felicitas is a senior policy officer at BMZ, who has also worked at international agricultural research, but also brings her perspective to the table by her role as a climate policy analyst at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Now, I would like to call on Martin to get the ball rolling on the scene with this intervention. Martin, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, it's, um, Stefan. And I would I'd like to thank the Federal Minister of um, Economic Cooperation of Germany for the invitation. The war in Ukraine, as you, have, as you rightly mentioned, has led to a sharp increase in both acute and chronic food insecurity. Food supply on the African continent has had been earlier convulsed by COVID-19 and climate shocks in the, in the Horn of Africa, the drought in the Horn of Africa and in the Sahel. But the latest exogenous shocks of lost supply and estimated 30 million tons of food coming from Russia and Ukraine has created the perfect storm and has an, an illumined human catastrophe if prompt action is not taken to mitigate lost supply. The world has scrambled to respond to the crisis. Like you know, the UN Global Crisis Response Group meets weekly looking for solutions on the shortfall in fertilizer and food. Secretary Yellen of the US Treasury also called for an action plan. The action plan put together by the international financial institutions calls for expansion of existing cash transfer food vouchers and school feeding programs. The plan also calls for making fertilizer and seeds available to smallholder farmers to raise local food production to bridge the shortfall. The plan also talks about policy reforms to create efficient private sector-led agro-input distribution systems and to build resilience in the world's poorest and most vulnerable um, farming populations. Germany has also established the Global Alliance for Food Security, the political alliance to catalyze an agile, immediate, and coordinated response to the unfolding global food security crisis. GAFS, as is known, focuses on advice, action, and advance. The French also announced the Food and Agriculture Resilience Mission that seeks to boost agricultural production and ensure the most vulnerable countries have access to food. Farm, as is known, has three pillars of trade, solidarity, and production. We at the African Development Bank, Africa's premier bank, launched on May 30th the African Emergency Food Production Facility, a $1.5 billion short-term intervention to raise production of wheat, maize, rice, and soybean to compensate for lost supply from, from Ukraine. The African Emergency Food Production Facility focused on three areas. First is delivering certified seeds and fertilizer, an extension service to 20 million farmers. Secondly, providing finance for large scale purchase of fertilizer. And thirdly, supporting policy reforms to facilitate modern input distribution to farmers, particularly strengthening national institutions that oversee this input market. The plan has a expected output of 38 million tons of food, broken down into 11 million tons of wheat. 80 million tons of maize, 6 million tons of rice, and 2.5 million tons of soybean. The plan builds on this very successful program of the bank called Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation. This is a program that is done in collaboration with the International Agricultural Research Centers or the CGIAR, National Agricultural Research Systems also, and then um, private, private seed companies and a host of others, including government. TAT, as we call it, has in the last three years worked to, to increase generation, early, early, early generation seed production, and, and also to help 
strengthen the seed policy in many countries. That has actually delivered um, to our regional member countries very, in very, very successful examples. Take the example of wheat in Ethiopia. Ethiopia used to grow wheat only in, in, in the uplands, but with that, Ethiopia was able to move wheat to the lowlands with the heat tolerant wheat varieties that actually increased production of wheat in the lowlands from 5,000 hectares in 2018 to 650,000 hectares in 2022. For the first time, Ethiopia this, this year did not import wheat. Ethiopia actually plans to export wheat. But in conclusion, we should never let the crisis go to waste. The bank and many other development partners are actually working to turn the crisis from the Ukraine war, the food crisis from the Ukraine war, into a transformation of Africa's agriculture. I'll just list a few before I stop. The first one is competitive production. The reason why Africa turns to Ukraine and Russia is because of the cheap food. But if we can get certified seeds of climate adaptive varieties to farmers, if we can get climate smart infrastructure, small scale irrigations, if we can get hard and soft market infrastructure, drying, cleaning, sorting, and other quality parameters to farmers, we can actually create competitive production on the African continent. Secondly, if we, can, we need to get a credit to all actors in the value chain. And we also need to have risk mitigation measures, whether advisory, crop insurance, early pest and disease warning. And lastly, an enabling policy environment. We have to create incentives for the private sector to invest. I would like to stop here, but I'd like to just say, say, say in closing, even though this crisis from the, from the war in Ukraine has created a perfect storm, but we believe very strongly with the collaboration of everybody, we can turn this perfect storm into a perfect agricultural transformation story for the African continent. Thank you very much. I'm back to you, um, Stefan. Thanks, Martin. Also, I'm, uh, I'm not surprised also that you can present an African response to a, to a, a global problem also because the African continent is hit very hard and therefore also African responses are, of course, very, very needed. Um, yeah, and as you said, every crisis may also represent an opportunity also if we address it rightly. Therefore, I would like to invite to see um, Sebastian Lesch video presented. So let technology play its role. Laura, Alberta, can you share the video of Sebastian? Aha, now it moves. Thanks. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's policy seminar, which is a joint initiative between German Development Corporation and the CGIAR IFPRI. Uh, thank you, Martin, for elaborating implications of the global food security crisis in Africa and uh, the efforts undertaken by the African Development Bank and by partners to mitigate its effects. Let me take the next few minutes to outline the views and efforts of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development to respond to the unfolding crisis. Five months ago, Russia invaded Ukraine. This is a humanitarian disaster. It's causing terrible suffering and destruction with dramatic repercussions far beyond Ukraine's borders. Prices have skyrocketed and food, fuel and fertilizer are becoming unaffordable for millions of poor people. This is a triple crisis of conflict, COVID and climate change, and it's dramatically exacerbating existing food security challenges in previously unknown magnitudes. After years of progress, hunger has been on the rise again since 2015. In 2021, between 700 and 830 million people worldwide faced hunger. Now, the war against Ukraine is turning this already grim situation into disaster. According to many sources, among them the World Food Programme and IFPRI, many more people are facing starvation or death in the next months. Climate change will only aggravate this acute crisis in the long term. According to IPCC projections, climate change will lead to a 14 to 27 percent reduction in land productivity in sub-Saharan Africa by 2080. However, one crisis must not be played off or weighed off against the other. Every crisis holds an opportunity, rather. This could and should and needs to be 
the starting point for the acceleration of the necessary transformation of agri-food systems towards resilience and sustainability. Now, as the first answer to the current global food crisis, the German G7 presidency, together with the World Bank, have initiated a Global Alliance for Food Security, short GAFS. GAFS was jointly launched at the G7 Development Ministers' Meeting on 19th of May 2022. This alliance is a joint, coordinated and global platform of solidarity as a shared response to this multidimensional crisis. GAFS is not a new institution, let me say that very clearly, but it is open to all interested parties, including like many governments, international organizations, global and regional initiatives, civil society and the private sector. In addition to the World Bank, the G7, the EU Commission, GAFS is already supported by more than 100 stakeholders. It's built around three focal areas, the so-called three A's. Advice provides regular, just-in-time knowledge sharing and analysis on latest food security crisis developments and informs swift, decisive action. Action tracks and catalyzes political and financial support, including funding priorities, gaps and opportunity. And lastly, advance shares and shapes forward-looking research and analysis on food policy and foresight. Now, as part of GAFS, the G7 have committed to an additional 4.5 billion US dollars to protect the most vulnerable from hunger and malnutrition, amounting to a total of over 14 billion US dollars as their joint commitment to global food security this year. What is crucially important now is that we provide a substantial and well-coordinated crisis response in the short term through GAFS, while at the same time, we make sure that we take the right pathway and drive a longer term transformation of agri-food systems that are better equipped, and better prepared to absorb shocks. Data, analysis, up-to-date information drive evidence-based crisis responses and inform swift political, financial and technical action. Research is a key building block to support GAFS advice and advance focus areas. Innovative and context specific solutions in all areas of agri-food systems, including crops, livestock, land and water, fisheries and agriculture, forestry and their related value chains drive the transformation of agri-food systems. The Global Research Partnership for a Food Secure Future, CGIAR, it's the world's largest international agri-food research consortium. The CGIAR is therefore in a unique position to solve today's and tomorrow's interconnected food, land, water and climate crisis. I'm very much looking forward to gain inspiration from this seminar today on how we can further strengthen the close collaboration between CJR's research on agri-food system transformation and policy response mechanisms, such as the Global Alliance for Food Security. Thank you very much. I can thank Sebastian Lesch also, although he won't hear me because it's a video recording. Nonetheless, also I would like to uh, thank the colleagues also who actually have enabled the uh, video recording of Sebastian Lesch also. And I think there is a good reminder about that, even if we look at the current crisis also that has been triggered by the uh, war in Ukraine or so that climate change is not forgotten and that alliances also rely on solidarity and GIFS or GAFs also is one of it for a coordinated effort to address global challenges. Uh, equally important it is that of course we look at that the fact that a key element to all of that is educated information also through science and research. Please, that was the first round of uh, setting the scenes also. So please do not uh, forget to post your questions into the chat box and the other opportunities and possibilities also to interact for questions to be compiled. And please do not forget when you address questions and comments to indicate to whom those questions and comments should be addressed. Yeah, I would like to now open the second round of, of contributions to this webinar. As we have said also, 
science plays a role. And the second round of this webinar also is where we'll have the global directors of the science groups at the Global Research Partnership for a Food Secure Future, formerly known as CGIR. And they will possibly highlight why CGR is uniquely placed to uh, equipped uh, to respond. I will start with presenting uh, Sonia Vermeulen, who is the CGR Interim Global Director of Genetic Innovation Science Group. Before doing this excellently also, she has been a Director of Programs at the CGR Systems Organization and held leadership positions at WWF and IIID. She is a natural scientist and also brings an African perspective from Zimbabwe to it. Her experiences do not only cover plant genetics, but also tropical resource ecology and healthy and sustainable diets and population biology. She's joined by Joe or Johan Swinnen, who is the Global Director of System Transformation in CGIR and the Director General of the International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI, who is today's co-host of this seminar. This research institute has already contributed substantially and a lot in analysis and policy recommendations related to the current situation. Joe has been involved in think tanks, task forces, champion groups on climate change, sustainable and renewable energy, environment, and the reduction of food losses and waste. As an economist at World Bank and the European Commission, he also knows well about the policy advisory aspect to it. Third director that we have with us today is Martin Kropf, who is the Global Director for Resilient Agri-Food Systems at the Global Research Partnership for a Food Secure Future, CGIR, and the former Director General of the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, CIMIT, as we have been talking a lot about wheat these days. Before he held leadership positions in Wageningen University and he holds a honorary doctorates from the National University of Life and Environmental Sciences in Ukraine and the Czech University of Life Sciences. The three are well placed to give us their views on how partnerships contribute to afford a secure future. And in the current role, they also can position themselves on the research and policy interface to address the global food security crisis. Jo will be the first to share his view Followed, oh, no, I'm, I'm followed by Sonia and then Martin. Please, let's get started. Okay, thank you so much, Martin, and, and thanks very much for uh, the organizers, particularly GIZ and BMZ, for inviting us here and for giving us the opportunity to uh, present the CJR's offer, if you want, uh, to respond to the global food crisis. And, uh, to, and also relate that to the GAFS uh, initiative uh, at the same time. I should also thank Martin Frigan and, and Sebastian Lesch for their introductions in which they, ex they basically, uh, their perspective, but also their support for the CGIR, their vision that we can make an important contribution here, which is very much appreciated. We have a fairly extended slideshow. Um, I was not entirely sure how the introductions would go, so I will go fast through the first part, which is really much more uh, a review, uh, review of the scene, where we have started from, and then I will slow down uh, when we are talking specifically about our initiatives. Uh, I will talk about, uh, uh, basically, we we're pr proposing a package of seven um, innovation areas, as we call them in this case, and I'll talk about the first few, and then my uh, colleagues will come in and take some time to uh, go into greater depth in uh, their uh, expertise area. Let's put it that way. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, essentially, this was already mentioned by Stefan, okay? If you look back, right? So, in 2015, the fantastic period of declining poverty, of, redu of improving food security in the world for a 25 30 year period came to an end okay it halted and there's been a significant reverse at the same time we know that our food systems now are a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions to climate change and uh, we also know that a lot of food and, uh, is wasted and lost in the world okay 14 percent at the farm and midstream level 70 percent at the retail and consumer level okay and so these are structural trends this is before covid or before the ukraine war next slide please if we then look at the uh, look a bit of better definition, more narrow definition, I think a more adequate uh, 
identification of hunger and malnutrition, we see the numbers are much worse, okay? Three billion dollar people in the world cannot afford a healthy diet. Two billion people have micronutrient deficient. I mean, there are huge challenges uh, we are facing. Next slide, please. The COVID-19 we know has made things worse. The impact of, on global poverty has been very severe and these income effects have had a really big impact across the world on the food security of people. I mean, and the declines in incomes, job losses, et cetera, have probably been the most important factor. And with that, we see not only an, a decline in, in food security, if you want, but if you look at the nutrition situation, it's worse again. Typically, people, when their income falls, shift from more nutritious food to cheaper uh, caloric-based food. Next slide, please. What's interesting is that, and important to realize, this is a global phenomenon, okay? If we look, it's not that it's in one particular region, for example, South Asia or Africa, things are uh, worsening. Actually, it is across all the regions in the world where it's worse. So it really is a global phenomenon, and so it requires a global um, addressing it as a global phenomenon. So it, it requires an institution, an organization an approach, which is truly global in nature. Next slide, please. Um, and I put this slide in very particularly because the, the conflict issue is people refer to it, they know it when they think about specific, but it's the structural nature of the conflict and the worsening food security is really very substantive. You see that since uh, roughly again around 2014 15 the number of what's called forcibly displaced people in the world that's people who have to leave their villages their homes their regions sometimes their countries because of conflict uh, has uh, increased very dramatically and this is uh, very strongly related to acute food security problems next slide please Again, so these numbers which I just showed were before uh, the Ukraine crisis. And so this is an, uh, a table and a figure from the annual, which is now annual global report on food crisis. And so you see that uh, the, on the right hand panel, these numbers signal how conflict and security, how weather extremes, economic shocks are contributing to this. This is food crisis, it's a more narrow definition. It's uh, acute food insecurity. But you see these numbers are very large and each of these factors are contributing to that. So that also means the implication, we have to address all of these things together. We cannot just focus on one particular element. Next slide, please. If you look at the Ukraine-Russia war, okay, clearly they have made things much worse as everybody knows by now. And I think uh, Martin and, um, and Sebastian explained it very well, okay. But we should know that even before the war uh, started, before Russia invaded, food prices were very high, particularly uh, cereals prices and stock price stocks were fairly low. Okay, And so that meant that the shock of the Russia uh, invasion has been much larger than if we would be in a, in a different starting situation if you want. And of course, the impact has been unequal around, uh, around the world that in, in the early effects on the direct, let's say, food import uh, impacts. But you know, it's spilled over, as we all know now, through food prices across the globe, and again, has a, a global impact. Next slide, please. The, um, on the, the issue, which is now something which somehow we have not paid enough attention uh, at, at the, in the past, I think, is really on the input side, okay? So the fertilizer effect has come into very strong vision, access to fertilizer, which is constrained potentially very strongly for future harvest. But again, I mean, the slide on the right shows that fertilizer prices were very high already before the Russia invasion. Part of it was due to um, Chinese restriction on exports and fertilizer, et cetera, again, making the point that also in this area, it's not just the Ukraine, uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine war, but it's much more fundamental problem, which we need to address there. Next slide, please. This is my last uh, slide of the introduction overview. I think, and this is the key point here is uh, on the one hand, summarizing why we are at this point, the culmination of effect, the perfect storm, I think how Martin referred to it, is or, or Stefan. And so this is where it all comes together. Okay, so the, we are already in structural uh, deterioration of hunger malnutrition. COVID has reinforced it. This has hit, uh, so households are hit hard. And of course, budget, government budgets have hit, basically been used, I mean, been expanded already. And so that makes it much harder to respond. The uh, what also, I mean, if you look, this is a slide for the next of the past 25 years, 20, 21st century food prices. OK, and so when we talked about the 2007 uh, price shock, we talked about a shock. OK, shock means it's something which deviates from the normal. 
If you look at this price evolution, you see that there is no normal that is stable. Okay, the 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 the, the new normal is volatility. It's uh, prices going up and down. So that has all kinds of implications for the way we think about food systems, for the way way we should think about food policies, and for the importance of the resilience component of our transformation uh, model or transformation uh, targets. I would say. Next slide, please. Okay, so what does this all imply for uh, what we need to do? The key implication, and I think this is very consistent with what the previous speakers have said, this is a global crisis, so it needs a global solution, a global approach. It's also a systems crisis, so it requires a system solution approach. That means that technology is important, but will not do it by itself. Policy is important, but will not do it by itself. So we need the bundling of, of things. Okay, it also requires a multidisciplinary impact if you think bring it back to the science side and they have to work together it also there are very important short-term components clearly from the, the price spikes etc and then immediate import constraints food import constraints that we see but equally important are the medium and the long-term effects and so that means that we also have to have an approach solutions which have these three different components okay and i think together they reinforce the transformation the resilience agenda and the need to invest structurally, not just targeting the short-term responses or action, but uh, structurally in the long run as well. And we think that the CGR is really well positioned to do exactly that, okay? Our 2030 research and innovation strategy very much focuses on resilience, very much focuses on transformation. Our current portfolio of research, we call them initiatives as well. There are initiatives in the gaps, so we have to be a bit careful on the language here today. Um, are very much in line and so they contribute to also very much short medium and long-term focus and so that i think fits very well so overall we should continue on the road we are but that of course is not good enough we have to do more at the short run we are providing a, a series of critical analyses right now i mean in the past months uh, etc and we are also proposing here today uh, seven innovation areas uh, going forward next slide please the, um, this is just a quick illustration of the analysis that we've done, how we basically contributed to the public debate by op-eds, by uh, uh, blogs, by uh, organizing webinars, et cetera. And so we've had a lot of uh, media attention and, and policymakers' attention globally. It's a bit harder to put that in, in, in figures here, but I think it's really important what we have been doing already and what we continue to do. Next slide, please. Now, so what we will do the rest of the presentation is we will go through the seven uh, innovation areas as we have summarized here. Okay, so these are building on the 2013 strategy. They're not uh, substitutes for it. We actually want to continue our fully our uh, research and innovation strategy, but these are things we're going to emphasize, add on, expand, etc. in response to the crisis. Uh, we'll go through these and I will start with the first three and then I will pass it on to, to Sonia and then later to Martin. First slide, please. I think this is uh, possibly the, the easiest to explain. We need uh, the real-time monitoring, early warning are important, very important uh, areas of, of, uh, of uh, investment in, uh, in, or having there in, to respond to the crisis, okay? We already now have a whole series of, of trackers, of dashboards, of vulnerability dashboards. We just invested in a fertilizer market dashboards food price volatility uh, indicators, et cetera. I think what is needed is that we build this into a more structural system where we can, uh, of course, we can expand, make them better the indicator, but it's also building this as a system which is easily accessible for the world for uh, crises to come. Clearly here, there is a, a strong relationship with some of the work that is being proposed at GAPS, for example, the humanitarian monitoring, the market information, the, the dashboard initiative, and we should clearly link it up with, with, uh, with uh, these initiatives which are planned within GAS. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an indicator of an index which we are currently developing. It's very recent, okay, and these things need to be, um, need to be fine-tuned, et cetera, but that's really what we are working to, to give you an idea. Next slide, please. Um, the second area is in the, in the policy analysis and, and advice. Okay, clearly there, I don't think there will be as much uh, question that this is important. We are already doing quite a lot here. We are uh, involved in, in market analysis and policy analysis using our existing models, both our, our global models and country level models. I'll give an example in a second. 
we have, following up on that, have been engaged with the policy community through a variety of, of ways of communication mechanisms. And so we've worked with international organizations also to both interact with them in terms of discussion about the best policy is and to advise them as well. And of course, also linking up with stakeholders throughout the world. Again, here, I think the issue is to, to basically expand, make these things better, make them more disaggregated. Gender components are really important, which we do not have sufficient, I think, at this time. Also, the relationship with existing policy, the repurposing subsidy agenda or repurposing agricultural policy agenda is very much uh, should be integrated here. And I think very much our in-country capacity, where we work with countries uh, in uh, specialists in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, to build up their capacity to do the analysis and integrate them in a global system of this analysis. I think this is really crucial. Again, this is an issue of structural, uh, building more structure in it and seeing this as a medium to long-term investments rather than short-term responses where we use whatever we have at this moment. Third slide, please. And I'm going to, um, yeah, so here's some examples on, uh, uh, Maybe go back two slides, if that's possible, briefly. Yes, here on the right hand, the left hand is the analysis, analysis we do, for example, of trade policy, which is export constraints that we are tracking. On the right hand panel, this is very new. These are a series of country studies that we are doing where we use country specific models, where we try to estimate, to predict what the impact is of these world price changes on the prevalence of undernutrition, okay? And so we, we separate out here the food prices, fuel prices, fertilizer prices. So this is very recent news, a work that we are doing, and so very much a step in, in the direction. Uh, next slide, uh, just skip the slide. And then the, and then the third initiative, which I wanted to, um, or the innovation area I wanted to emphasize here, is, is a new innovation area which is also built in in our research portfolio but not yet active something which we are planning for an, an january 23 if everything goes well and this is very much focused on, on fragile systems okay and so there we have actually where everything kind of comes together in a more acute way and so this requires a set of very specific uh research activities but also this leading to uh, evidence-based policy advice evidence-based uh, actions for scaling up and the scaling up itself so this is all integrated in this system i'd be happy to write more details on this if you want but with that let me pass it to uh, our, my colleagues now to i think sonia is coming first thank you yo and moving to the next slide so, so as Yo has pointed out to us, shocks and crises in food systems are now the new normal. And what we need to do is move away from what we have been doing in the past few decades of a cycle of panic and overinvestment and then neglect and serious underinvestment into a much more sustained um, approach to resilient and responsiveness in food systems. And uh, seed systems and seed delivery can be a major part of the, the, this response. Um, so thinking about Ukraine now, but also thinking about future crises, what we would like to be seeing is seed systems that can much more rapidly respond to the crises that we're having um, to assure um, production responses and capacity uh, to support diets which aren't just meeting uh, the basics in terms of calories, but are also meeting people's broader nutritional needs. So thinking therefore also about animal foods, diverse diets. So CGIR, we're really trying to take um, a major step change now of, of moving from what has historically um, been criticized perhaps for being a rather supply driven approach to seed, um, breeding what the breeders know best and are best at to something which is very demand responsive looking at what is needed in countries and what's needed in terms of dietary needs households needs gender considerations what do women need um, in, in terms of uh, their their uh, cooking uh, household management and so on um, and also the environmental and, and climate factors so we have put together with our partners, um, particularly in Africa, but also globally, um, a very specific market intelligence approach and an, an initiative on this 
that is helping us really understand this demand in real time and respond to it. In the breeding space, it's around acceleration. Uh, breeding has historically taken an average of 15 years to get a breed to farmers. With crises like this and with climate change, we need to cut down that cycle considerably from 15 years. Part of this work is technical. Um, it's around genotyping, phenotyping, the use of modern tools, use of better data systems. But a lot of it is also regulatory, identifying and then solving the gaps in how seeds actually get to farmers. How quickly do we move them through pipelines? Um, and what are the local small scale private sector and government supported systems that get the seeds there? What kind of problems need solving? So we're doing this work together as, as a package in CGIR. And, and when we look at our seed system response to this crisis, it has to involve all of those components, uh, the markets, the breeding, the seed systems, but also needs to wrap those into the broader country programmatic contexts. What are countries trying to do to uh, have a short term food security response and also a longer term rural development response? How do we fit into major uh, continental programs like the African Emergency Food Production Facility or indeed global programs like the Global Alliance for Food Security? So what we're doing at the moment is, in the immediate term, a set of very place-based work that builds on ongoing programs there. So these can be building on programs such as our Seeds for Needs program in Ethiopia or the Serial Systems Initiative for South Asia, which are already very active in trying to uh, speed up the adoption of uh, great uh, seed varieties and associated technologies and also improving farmers' access, not only to those varieties and technologies, but also to the bigger set of, of market access and enabling um, factors. So we want to build up on those in the immediate term to identify places where there is a match um, between uh, the, the, the current uh, crises that governments are facing, essentially that gap um, between the imports and local production, and where local seed systems can address that. So for example, um, a major one major focus area is East Africa, where again, you've seen from Yo's data is a place where both GDP and poverty impacts are likely to be high. So we're working with partners there to uh, identify where this particular production stimulus of seed um, can be helpful in smallholder farming systems. Another example is across North Africa, um, Egypt stands out as a country that is particularly um, susceptible to an immediate wheat um, import gap. Um, and there we're looking at particularly alternative crops. Uh, so a country like Egypt is looking at whether local bread production, some of the wheat can be substituted with barley, and that comes through local supply from local systems. And there is a need to rapidly scale up the seed supply into those farming systems. Uh, to, to fill that gap. So as you can see, in the immediate term, very specific and locally relevant demand-driven responses. Um, but over the longer period, I've said here in the next three years, but this is a, a longer term um, agenda for CGIR and for all of us, is to do two things in our seed systems. One is to speed them up, make them faster, more agile, as I've already explained. And then the other part of that is greater resilience so that as future shocks come in, um, we are able to weather them, there will be less requirement uh, for external intervention. Um, we are doing this both again on the technological side, um, but also uh, some very specific uh, types of uh, policy uh, in, uh, interventions. So one a key thing at the moment, for example, is looking at whether registration of new varieties can be fast-tracked um, for those kinds of improved varieties uh, that are already at advanced stages of the development pipeline. This, this work is done together with national partners based, based on the demand within uh, local seed systems. 
The other part of it that is really worth mentioning is the way that the improved varieties we're working on with partners have built in resilience. So part of that is climate resilience. We heard from Martin earlier in, in this presentation around how in Ethiopia, for instance, heat tolerance in wheat has allowed the actual growing area to be larger in extent. Um, this, this matters, heat tolerance in wheat, in maize, in beans, are all things we work on with, uh, with our partners. And as well as increasing that range and therefore the flexibility of where these crops can be grown, they also help to weather the years uh, to provide a yield in the years where there may be droughts, uh, hot periods um, that would otherwise threaten the harvest. Um, similarly, CGR is also working on uh, resource, uh, resource uh, varieties that require fewer resources um, in terms of, for example, water and other parts of management. This again um, enables this kind of resilience um, in the seed systems. And with more of this, and particularly from the fertilizer perspective, I'll now hand over to colleague Martin Kropf. Over to you, Martin. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you, Sonia. Yeah, and thank you for the introductions uh, of the global issues. Uh, I'm a sailor, and uh, the first time uh, when I saw this movie, The Perfect Storm, where three storms got together, I got really nervous as a sailor. Uh, but now we have five of those uh, that, since the last two years, as we explained. But the good thing is also what I heard from everybody. We need to find solutions and we need to be committed together. And the CGIR is in its new structure as one CGIR, even more committed than ever to, uh, to help in this crisis. So um, let me say, uh, follow the innovation areas that we discussed. So number five is basically crisis, responsive crop, livestock and aquatic food systems management. Uh, in my global science group, it's basically focusing on crops, livestock and aquatic foods from field farm to regional level. And of course, we know the inherent fragility of our food systems. Um, they are even more fragile than we thought five years ago they are. And we have a strong reliance uh, on production in small number of key regions. Um, high prices of nutrient dense foods, uh, we all know, animal source, aquatic foods, putting them beyond the reach of poor consumers. So can I have next slide, please? So the challenges are global, but especially specific in the different regions. Can I have my next slide, please? Yeah. So crisis responsive, the actions we are taking already in a new portfolio, because the new strategy was already explained, is more demand driven throughout the portfolio. And uh, it's clear that we need a systems approach and new solutions on the ground, on the farms of 500 million smallholder farmers. So we, we help together with our partners always to create more resilient farming systems by focusing on farm management practices that increase the productivity, but at a more efficient level, improve livelihoods, adapt to climate change and reduce the environmental footprint of farming. So make our challenges coming together. And so it's not single solutions approaches that we are working on. But there's work on the way um, on uh, uh, a range uh, of topics, exploring ways to reduce the concentration of wheat supplies uh, and imported foods, enhance resource, resource use efficiency and diversification, and of course to promote climate smart agronomy and livestock management. And this seems simple, um, but there's a lot of new work going on and we are tapping on the latest developments, but helping uh, with our stakeholders to bring them up at scale in uh, the global south. Next slide, please. Yeah, what more is needed? So we have the current portfolio and a lot is going on, but in view of the huge crisis, we need more. And what more is needed uh, together with our partners? The development of suitability maps for alternative crops and checking with alternative crops. We have been focusing so much on the 20 mandate crops of the CGIR. We have to look broader as well. And in general, we see that everywhere there's a need for diversification of cereal-based systems with legumes, <laughs> climate resilient crops and aquatic foods um, and the integration of livestock uh, in mixed farming systems to reduce requirements for fertilizer nitrogen, improve water use efficiencies and increase drought resilience. Um, and closing the cycle, uh, improving local livestock systems through better feeding, breathing, breeding, health and market systems and of course a strengthened resilience as well 
And of course, in fish, we need to work on lower trophic species for aquaculture, which basically means, means we need vegetarian fish. Most of the fish uh, that we like so much, uh, especially in, in, in the West, uh, are predators. And so we need more fish to feed in feed for them than they produce themselves. And index-based insurance, and that's more from system transformation, of course, but it's important we work together across the different science groups. And we need, when you have more fertilizers, you need insurance for smallholder farmers as well. Next slide, please. So soil fertility solutions, it was mentioned already by many, also by Martin, uh, for resilience to fertilizer price and supply shocks, and especially in Africa. You know, the fertilizer use is so low and we need more fertilizer use, but of course it has to be used in a very efficient way uh, because it's getting more and more expensive. So the supply shocks uh, put future risks at harvest and uh, it has to translate into high prices over extended time. So the challenges are enormous around fertilizers. So it's not only about the technology, but it's also about the politics and uh, the environment. Next one, please. So the actions we are taking already, we have a big initiative, Excellence in Agronomy, where we bring the latest developments, innovations in agronomy together. So improving further efficiency of fertilizer use and the valorizing alternative sources of nutrients. But um, uh, it's very clear that, for example, in Africa, we cannot do without fertilizers. And uh, IFPRI has developed a great dashboard so to track availability and affordability of fertilizers, because especially we've seen now with the green war, how complex our systems are and how dependent we are on global relationships. Next one, please. Now the self-sufficiency of crop production. I would mention that later as well. Next one. Yeah, so soil fertility solutions. Uh, what more is needed? Of course, the tools analytics, the dissemination of integrated. Can you go back, please? The integrated soil fertility management. That's the key thing that you have to focus on. No, go further, one further. Next slide, please. Yeah, this one. Uh, options at scale. So, and then we work with several initiatives like Nature Plus and others uh, on those uh, resilient uh, systems and making sure that we have the right policies in place and uh, getting uh, the soil fertility situation at the farmer farmer's level correctly. So the challenges we need to address in another area. This is on strong national agriculture research and innovation systems for more resilient countries. This is crucial. We work together with the national systems in the countries where we work, and together um, uh, we need to beef up. And we have a, the national systems, of course, have a critical role to play, identifying, developing, but also scaling solutions in response to the country-specific needs um, uh, in the global food crisis. So, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, so actions we are taking already. In our new portfolio, we are very committed to join forces with the NARIS, uh, National Agriculture Research and Innovation Systems. Something is wrong with the slight uh, tipping, I think. Can you go back? Yeah, so uh, basically in the Global South, to bolster in-country capacity for research and development. We call it also capacity sharing with the national systems. We work with the national systems on scaling, but also together with the private sector in them. So the new portfolio uh, heavily relies on those collaborations with CGIR research and the NAR stakeholders. And on the floor, they work well together. So they have been involved very strongly in uh, developing the new research portfolio that we have. And that is really directly responding to country needs and the demands. Next slide, please. I don't know where. It, oh yeah. um, so, what more is needed now to further enhance the joint development of scaling through initiatives response to the global crisis and to build resilience? 
he creates a direct pathway for involvement of Najland and scaling in the global south. So we need more funding also for NARIS research, linking uh, for, uh, with us for scaling activities that are aligned with our initiatives. Facilitating south to south and triangular research and scaling collaboration with global south partners and ensuring that CGIR and NARS partners in the global south harness the full potential of their collaboration and prototyping novel research and scaling partnership model. So there is a lot more needed because we want to make sure also that we help the national systems to become stronger and stronger so that together we can uh, help solving those super big issues in the global south in several of the countries. Next slide, please. Yeah, and then something that is new for the CGIR at scale. We have global initiatives where we come from a disciplinary area, but most of the time in the food system, um, when you look at the demand, what's going on in the food system from the consumer to uh, the new varieties, to the seeds, etc., to management of the crops and to policies, etc., it depends where the bottleneck is that you have to solve. So now we have six regional integrated initiatives building on the global initiatives where they are more disciplinary driven and for based on the main challenge in the region um, uh, the bottlenecks are identified and the research agenda is being identified and then together we try to scale uh, innovations uh, in the countries in the regions so basically coming from all the science areas um, that we work on and from our partners as well so from system transformation on policy on management and on better seats so basically uh, in the six regions there are different issues and please look at our website they are being described i won't go in detail here but a very important one in most of them of course is climate change drought heat and over reliance on cereals and so we have to diversify the system to become more uh, resilient but also to become more nutritious as well thank you very much and next slide please that's the last one that gives the overview next one please yeah so um so delivering the response, the key features and operational modalities, basically we built on what we have delivered so far and through the new portfolio, we carefully calibrated to stakeholder demand, delivered in close collaboration with partners, deployed quickly in response to rapidly evolving impacts and needs, and draw on the full range of capacity. So um, overseen by the three science group directors that you just heard, we have a mega teams working with us building the initiatives and especially great collaborators from the national systems and the next slide shows just the overview um, and i won't go in detail there next slide please next slide please Okay, so the next slide was not put in, doesn't matter. It basically indicates that we have global initiative, we have regional initiatives, uh, we build them together, uh, we have our stakeholders strongly involved, but also advanced centers, and we really want to, to work together with our national partners to, uh, to innovate at scale and hopefully contribute to solve some of the big issues in the food system. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Martin, Sonia, and you in that order also even if there has been a little bit of delay in advancing slides and hearing what Martin had to say, I think we grasped the most also. And uh, as uh, you started with in 2008, 2007, 2008 is when I came back as an agronomist also based on the call that La Vie Cher, that there is expensive life also of actually the role of science research and agronomists also was again then on the table also but since then things have not calmed down things have come to sort of higher and uh, shorter felt amplitudes also so resilience reliable and autonomous responses also are needed and i think what we also need to keep in mind is 80 million of possibly displaced people before because of these reasons also we all know a displaced person also is food insecure and not in a very happy position neither. So 
We have heard about that we need to have short term, medium term and long term responses uh, and uh, the short term to respond to crisis, but we need to have strategies for the medium term and we have good policies on the long term. Please let me not forget also our audience that should you have comments and questions that should and may have been triggered through the sort of quite substantial and comprehensive presentation of the science group directors, please let us hear your reactions and questions to them. There is much more that can be said than time allows at this point of time. Now, we would like to turn to two colleagues who have uh, carefully followed previous uh, speakers. And we would like to have their point on view on how policy and research can, uh, the, the interface can be translated into practice uh, and their experiences they may have had from their respective perspectives. And as I said, while the two colleagues also will still voice their comments and remarks, please do the same also in the chat function and all the possibilities that is uh, offered on IFPRI's website. Now, let me introduce the two stakeholders that will bring their perspectives on how to bridge science and policy to practice from two different perspectives. First, I would like to introduce Francine Picard Mukasi, as a co-founder and director of partnerships at the Shamba Center, leading stakeholder engagement and advocacy strategies across and overseeing the delivery of advisory services over the last 15 years, Francine has worked in more than 20 countries, advising policymakers, parliaments, regional economic commissions and institutions in Africa on food, agriculture, land, climate change, gender equality and regional integration. Her experiences also includes working with the Pan-African Parliament. And why that is so important also, I think from some of the maps that you have seen in the previous presentations, Africa is always most hit by some of those uh, challenges also, and we need to address that this will become more resilient. Now, the second one is Soriwane also, who would look more on a crisis response to it also, as it has been with the World Food Programme, uh, since 1989, and he has served in several duty stations, more than nine of them at the World Food Program and in the World Food Program headquarters in Rome. And now he's currently seconded to the African Union Development Agency, AUDA, NEPAD, also as a senior advisor to the chief executive officer. Zori has also worked for the International Labor, Organiz uh, Labor Organization and brings his, his perspectives as an economist and engineer. Now, sort of, we can see that we have different perspectives. We would like to see your thoughts also from an African perspective. So, dear Francine and dear Sorry, what would you like to pick up in particular from the previous interventions and your own perspective with regard to addressing the global food security crisis, which can be put into practice from research into policy and into action? Sorry, would you like to give it a start? The floor is yours. Yes. Sir. Yes, uh, uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I do thank the presenters for their insightful uh, presentation. It was uh, really uh, brilliant. And, and uh, a lot has been said on the impacts of uh, the Russia-Ukraine uh, crisis, uh, uh, some of which I will certainly repeat. And I do believe it is important to stress that uh, this crisis uh, exacerbated the vulnerability of the population in Africa already grappling with the adverse uh, effects of uh, conflict, uh, climate change, COVID-19, and uh, the high cost of uh, uh, living. At the same time, and I really uh, liked what uh, uh, Martin from uh, ADB uh, uh, mentioned, you know, uh, we can see it as an opportunity. The Russia-Ukraine crisis proved to be a wake-up uh, uh, call for Africa uh, with uh, the fertilizer shortage and uh, food supply chain challenges that could lead to a food production uh, decrease, uh, inflation and the widespread uh, increase in the price of uh, basic uh, uh, 
uh, food stuff. Uh, during, during their media uh, summit recently in Lusaka, the leaders of the African Union have uh, extensively discussed uh, the short, medium and long term measures. And it came out clearly that a new impetus uh, needs to be given to domestic solutions that would combine research policy and implementation with uh, special emphasis on fertilizers and uh, food reserves. And among those measures, I can mention a few uh, uh, that uh, has been, have been touched you know, uh, during those presentations. And uh, the first is to support local food production and uh, facilitating smallholder access to fertilizers uh, locally, to shorten global supply chain by investing in local production, transformation, and agro processing uh, capacity to promote climate smart agriculture and uh, the use of fertilizers while supporting the development of uh, local and regional uh, value chain. This also has been stressed and also it's important that governments uh, develop policies and encourage the private sector and research institutes to collaborate to build resilient uh, local food supply chain. And finally, to increase the investment uh, into the agriculture se sector, you know, in line with uh, the Malabo uh, Declaration. In fact, uh, I am joining this policy seminar today from Dakar, where I am attending uh, a three-day African Union Development Agency-led high-level consultative dialogue and reflection on uh, the implementation of the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development uh, Program commonly known as uh, uh, CADEP and food systems uh, delivery. We will be discussing how national and regional agricultural implementation plans are driving the agriculture transformation processes and building resilient food system, and how this could be further strengthened. The consultation will also make recommendations aiming at stimulating agricultural growth to reduce poverty and inequality and achieve improved food and nutrition security. Now, and rightly so, attention must increasingly shift to how to make it happen. How to make it happen, taking into account the local political economy, including socio-economic and ecosystem condition. That is how and where I do believe that uh, the research, uh, policy, and implementation nexus will come even more and, uh, you know, uh, I believe it, 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 we need a collective effort, you know, and uh, uh, what is important, it has been mentioned already, it is uh, multi-sectorial and uh, multi-partner, multi-institution uh, efforts. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Surya. Sorry. And uh, thanks again for highlighting and, and saying from where you speak. Because I think that is important to see that there are many more heads put together also to find appropriate solutions that no one can find alone. Okay, Francine, you had uh, the advantage of listening the most to all the different presentations. So maybe you have the most comprehensive view already, but let's see, there are some questions also coming up from the audience already. Thanks very much, please. Thank you, Stefan. I would like also to praise uh, the speaker. They made a brilliant, brilliant presentation that gave us a lot of thoughts uh, to think through. Um, maybe I will, maybe uh, this conversation was really uh, important because you, we all use uh, words like fragile, uh, the perfect storm, I like it, because we all know that we are in that situation that we need to react. We need to react quickly and it's quite also important to consider that there is already a collective and a global efforts towards how can we ensure that we are responding to those cri to that crisis and how best to do it. So science and research are really needed. And I will start maybe to say that when the presentation starts with the GAFs, it also enhances the fact that we have a mechanism that would like to enhance coordination, uh, that want also to uh, improve the data availability and in identify also where the resources need to go and where they need to, to be addressed. And uh, I think also we are also expecting for the sciences in this crisis, in this short term, to tell us exactly how they consider where we can mobilize those uh, scientists. 
uh, can we mobilize within six months to take the lesson from what the the innovation uh, are telling us and can can we are we able to disseminate them in these six months to help prevent the crisis we are also expecting that strong messages from a uh, researcher and I think during that conversation, we heard about the great innovation for drop resistance, crops, fertilizer, climate resilience, and can we scale up uh, within these six months? And I think that we need also to hear this uh, from uh, our researcher. I think it's also important that they consider that there is a short, medium and long term, but we need those responses now, and that responses, we are also expecting them to provide it uh, now. Uh, the long term is really important because it's also to tell us now that our system is, is failing. It's failing us and we need to be more uh, comprehensive uh, to risk changes. And I think the world, like the structural change is quite needed. And I think that the research and the science are providing us some kind of solution that policymakers need to hear that and also respond to that because we cannot continue, the world cannot continue that, that, that way. We have like these three crises and we need to change it. And we know that uh, our efforts, now that we are having that collective effort, we need to build on that and, and find solution quite uh, soonest. Thank you. Thank you, Francine. So you had again, as I said, the opportunity to look at things in a in an overview also what I've, I've heard very clearly also that the collective effort also is so important also and I think that came already across earlier so and if I'm looking at the, some of the questions that we have received from the audience also I would like to sort of uh, bring back one of our first speakers also because I mean the African Development Bank started to setting the scene with with Martin also and uh, yeah there has been uh, questions also related to sort of structural changes also and I will read I will read one and add a second one to it also um, to Martin also and uh, others can eventually complement also so can food importing countries' trade agreement requirements beyond local sustainability standards impact on productivity and trade and or jeopardize food security? So it's also the structural issue also on how sort of relationships are built between the countries. So that is more on that collaborative aspect. And then I would like to sort of uh, reflect a question that has been asked in different formats from different uh, participants in the audience not only to Martin, but I will give you the first uh, chance to respond to it also. How will the responses also be gender responsiveness? Because when we talk about food insecurity, when we talk about crisis also, there are a specific group also that might be hit first also, young and female uh, persons also, they suffer most from displacement and food insecurity and malnutrition, but we didn't hear that much also on that global response. So Martin, try to whatever, say something okay. about trade relationship, but don't forget about those who are most vulnerable, please. Right, right. so let me begin with this with the second question. And actually it's a very important question because like, you know, women are the most affected by food insecurity. They take care of the home. And secondly, also women, um, predominantly in, in the, the most important actors in the in, in food value chains on, on, on the continent, either in production or, or value addition. And first of all, one of the things that we have done at the African Development Bank is to look for systems that are um, gender agnostic, you know, systems that, that, that actually sidesteps the advantages that men usually have. For example, um, the electronic wallets or the access-based platforms to distribute inputs. Usually, these platforms are based upon registrations of, um, of, of, of farmers, male and female farmers, and they, they go directly to the um, beneficiary. You know, you don't have to go through any intermediary. So these are one of the ways we're trying to make sure that women are, are, are you know, are, are rich, you know, predominantly, you know, you know, you know with these inputs, because we all know that um, if you are to register everybody, women will be more, and if you don't have to go through any um, intermediary, women will definitely benefit more. So that's the first thing. Secondly, also very quickly, um, we're also trying to ensure 
that um, opportunities for women, particularly financing, that's why we, the bank has what we call the AFAWA, Affirmative and Women for Financing for Agriculture. So the SMEs, the agro dealers, the last mile delivery, you know, is, is we actually target women to make sure that they are actually you know, benefiting from finance credit to be able to um, at least um, you know, you carry on the business. And on, on, on the first question on the trade, this is a very, very important question. You know, there's a lot of production, but often it's, um, prices are distorted by, by wrong trade policies and that eventually lead to, you know, discouraging the farmers because the, the prices are not good. But, 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 but I think your question has to do more with, um, you know, with countries that are vulnerable, you know, because they are more vulnerable to, 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 to this food crisis simply because of the trade barriers also. Again, and I'm very happy that uh, Mr. S I'm sorry, um, one actually mentioned the meeting in Lusaka. You know, you know, we have to take a a regional approach to this. You know, and I know the World Bank also has a lot of um, of, um, of 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 interventions on trying to remove you know, trade barriers. It's very mm -hmm. important at, at this time of crisis that we don't allow trade barriers to even create even worse situations. So let, let, let me stop there um, and allow allow them to also, also to respond. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So, so because with the interventions, of course, you need to have the target that you shouldn't make things worse than they already are. So you need to bear in mind sort of what are positive and negative possible intended or non-intended side effects or so and keep these things very much, very much in mind. I would now throw a question up to, let's say, to who would raise first his hand eventually to, to raise it also. But of course, we we talked about sort of that uh, the world, we need to promote and intensify production. We talked about fertilizers and uh, we also need to look at the consumption of local traditional and indigenous neglected food. I think there was something about uh, barley production, which is not so neglected food also, but to replace uh, 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 wheat in bread also. And I know Martin has been working on cassava bread in Nigeria sort of. There are a number of things also that could be put on the, on the scene. Also, so how do you look at it, indigenous and neglected foods from that perspective? And how can you, we sort of promote sort of this, uh, sort of when structural changes need to be done also, but we should learn from current practices, from agroecology, from land preservation, from, from practices that are already there, sort of that make and keep eventually systems more resilient than they currently are to be more self-sufficient also to be able to store and not to rely on food and cheap, cheap, eventually cheap and uh, uh, non-reliable food imports. So agroecology was on the topic, uh, production and uh, consumption of alternative or eventually neglected foods and the self-sufficiency plans based on previous experiences. Who is ready? to take one of those questions. Can I come in, Stefan? Yes, you, as I said, the first one to raise his hand is the first one to deliver. So you're, the floor is yours. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Actually, let me uh, maybe also start with, with making a point on, on the gender issue or the gender question. I think it's it's a very important uh, point. Um, it's gender is actually, we actually thought about putting it up as a special, as a separate innovation area, right? But then we decided to have it like as a cross cut the theme across all, all the initiatives. I mean, if you go to the slides in, I mean, I, maybe I went a bit too fast or so, but gender is mentioned actually on on, uh, certainly on the first three slides related to the early warning system, the policy modeling and advice and the, uh, the actually it's a special section even also in the, uh, in the fragile areas, uh, uh, innovation area. And, and as you, uh, during the presentation, Sonia also estimated on the, on the seed side, okay, how the generation comes in there. So I think it's very much true the portfolio that, that we propose. Reg regarding the trade issue, um, there, I think, you know, the, the, a lot of the discussion now puts, comes back to the age old questions of, of whether trade is good for food security, for development, etc. Right. And I think it's a bit of a, a false, uh, contra uh, false conflict is, that's, that's put there. I think the, you know, tra open trade is really essential component of a resilience strategy. I think because a lot of the, for example, think about climate change, think about local conflicts, right? They are essentially trade as a way to buffer against 
uh, big shocks that that is happening. Of course, if the shock is happening externally through trade, you can import the effects as we see now, right? But I think as an overall strategy, it's really an, an essential component there. Now, of course, there's a difference between if you depend for 90% of essential products uh, on, on imports and then you import from a single country, I mean, that is very different from uh, seeing trade as a component of a resilience strategy. So I think there the issue diversification of, of, of sources from where you import is very important. But I think also we have to think of this as diversification of your consumption basket, okay? And there I think that imported food, locally produced foods are much more complements than, than actually going in contradiction. And I think that's how we should think about it going further. I also think it brings back the nutrition issue, which is in this whole debate or basically centralizes the nutrition issue much more much better because the issue is is important in terms of the food that you consume, how that relates to um, to the trade issue, what you import, what you source locally. I think we, it should be part of a broader question. I think there. Let me leave it at that. I'm I'm going to ask uh, Martin and uh, Sonia to comment on some of the other points. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, because you may still have an opportunity in the wrap up also. So don't wrap it up already. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I leave it to Sori first also. Yes, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you so much. I want to uh, comment uh, uh, quickly on the uh, the trade uh, aspect. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I do believe that uh, it is important that uh, uh, in Africa, uh, regional integration is uh, promoted and uh, uh, further leveraging the Africa continental free trade area. I think uh, that is very important uh, for market uh, uh, transparency and the second point i wanted to make uh, is especially on uh, how to involve uh, more uh, to target more women you know uh, i also am of the view that uh, 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 women and uh, uh, in general the beneficiaries uh, needs to be involved you know from the design stage of uh, uh, projects uh, and uh, actions uh, that will be uh, targeting them and that way, you know, you can uh, uh, better take uh, into consideration their specific uh, needs. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Sori, again, also for that aspect. Also, as I said, global problems need a global response, and therefore the trade should not be restricted or should not hamper the situation also. But we need to, I think we need to how do we say is I think the saying is that we need to walk the talk also when we talk about diversification for small scale farmers also maybe we need to take that one up to another level also about diversifying and sort of ensuring that we have storage capacity also that can bring us through difficult time because I think the uh, last trends also were sort of more of the just in time production and half whatever take opportunities on the markets and, and and consume what is now available without having in mind that we actually need to learn from our grandparents also who had a seller to store food in it. Sonia, you will have the last voice from the science group directors before I hand over to the wrap up session. Please, Sonia. Uh -huh. Thanks, Jeff, and that's kind of you. I thought it would be worth uh, saying for all of us, just a stimulating thought that, you know, these crises can also be a moment of opportunity. So for instance, when we think about things such as dietary diversification, you know, those moments when new foods have been introduced in a moment of crisis, sometimes they've stuck and they've gone on to diversify people's diets. It doesn't always work. I'm thinking of, you know, with yellow maize imports into Southern Africa during drought periods, they became viewed as, as you know, a, a, a punishment food almost and, and didn't stick. But there've been other opportunities where, for example, new fishes have been introduced into people's diets and have just become part of the cuisine. And then the same goes in, in the policy environment. So we've seen, um, uh, policy interventions during crisis staying. So in, in our last major food price crisis and in uh, around 2008, 2009, uh, for example, one of the things that was introduced there was a, a global information system. So we have a much better understanding now of the stocks and reserves 
in different countries, and, and that's perpetuated. Um, and and um, similarly, we've seen that kind of crisis response in particular countries, which has been um, gender responsive, mm -hmm. you know, understanding that, that when men are just outside of the, the rural farming economy, and um, they've had to step in and um, extend services and particular rights to yep. women, which has had a long lasting effect. So just, just to raise that point, thanks all. Yeah, thanks, Sonia. Also for bringing, as I said, the African perspective for the white and yellow maze. It's exactly what we actually want. Martin, you will have another opportunity to say a few words, and and maybe that would need to shorten Joe's wrapping up before I hand over to Felicitas. Martin, please. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Stefan. Now, I think the issues raised are very, very important. So gender and youth. Both are very crucial. And also for youth, we have to make farming attractive for young people. And that's what we also try to do with our initiatives uh, that include digital uh, solutions and mechanization, small scale mechanization. I think yeah. this is a crucial thing for the future of farming uh, for smallholder farmers to make it still attractive to for young generations. More self-sufficient, look at the regional integrated initiatives. They also work mainly on uh, diversification and solutions, integrated solutions. And I hope that we can really scale them up in the coming years in the different regions. And agroecology, nature positive, uh, we are bringing the, these solutions together because, of course, we need nature based approaches in crop protection, uh, crop management, like conservation agriculture, but always science based and evidence based. I think that's crucial because we need to have solutions that are really working for the farmers. Thank you. Yeah, and they need to work both fast in the medium and in the long term. I think that is also very important. And you mentioned that in the presentations. Good. Very little time left also. Joe, do you still urge to make a wrap up or can I eventually ask uh, Francine to say a few words and then I'll hand over to Felicitas. Joe, you are on the program to wrap up, maybe. Yeah, let me just use one minute, if that's OK. Yeah. The, uh, I think that, as Martin already said, OK, this is very important for us, this type of engagement. The reason is what we are proposing. I mean, we've worked hard on it, thought hard of it. But of course, getting input from outside uh, is, is, and particularly from the people who are on the panel here, our stakeholders, our donors, and our international organization we collaborate, is really important to fine tune what we are offering and also to adjust it if, if, if needed. Uh, I think the point, the second point is that we are on the same point on, on an agreement on a lot of fundamental issues. I think many people have stressed, listen, don't only look at the short run, the structural issues have to be addressed as well. So the medium and the long run, I think we all agree on that. It's a systems approach, it's a global approach. I mean, there, I think we're also very much in agreement. And the thing which came back several times is that this is terrible situation we're in. It is a big crisis, but it's also an opportunity. And so the Sonia referred to how the 2008 crisis led to, for example, the Amos program, uh, the Amos project, which is really helping us now. You know, the COVID-19 crisis also basically introduced a lot of innovations in global supply chain, both public supply uh, supply systems and, and private supply. And so this is shows things can be done. I think that's a big lesson there. And I think the last point is our link to the gaps to global lines on food security. And there we have to work a bit more, maybe on, in, uh, sitting together with people who are actually involved. And so definitely more than happy to talk to, to BMZ and GIZ about this on terms of how our proposal links into the various initiatives that are taking place, the dashboards, the yeah. monitoring systems, the sustainable agriculture initiative, et cetera. There. I think we, we can contribute to several of these and make sure this works, just what the mechanisms are, the mechan mechanics to make. Let me, leave, let me leave it at that. Thank you, Jo. And you mentioned the word or the abbreviation BMZ, and that's the time for Felicitas to come in, please. Thank you, Stefan. Well, first of all, allow me to join Sebastian Lesch in saying how delighted I am to see this second event of the joint seminar series of BMZ, CGIR, and if we come to live today. It was really very impressive for me to listen to the presentation by Martin Kopf, Johan Swinnen, and Sonja Vermollen outlining the various ways in which CGIR research supports not only the needed short-term monitoring of um, and response to the crisis, 
but also all the work that has been done since decades on medium to long term solutions towards the resilient agri food system transformation. And I think it became very clear today that for the required food system transformation, science already provides many of the answers needed and is now key for policy to pick up on these solutions more strongly. We then heard Sori Yuan and Francine Pikamukazi gave very valuable insights on how the science and the CGIRR research agenda could align even more closely with policy responses efforts, such as the Global Alliance for Food Security that was introduced by Sebastian Lesch in the beginning. And I just want to conclude by a few key points. So it is, I think we all agree, development policy can effectively contribute to combat hunger and malnutrition. And that is why the transformation of agri-food systems is one of key of five key priority areas of German development cooperation. And protecting the most vulnerable, whom the food crisis threatens to hit hardest, means taking immediate, joint and coherent action. Now, while the Global Alliance for Food Security aims to support substantial and well-coordinated crisis response in the short term, it is key not to lose sight of the necessary longer term transformation of agri-food systems. And I think everyone agreed today that we can and we need to take this crisis as an opportunity to drive forward and achieve that transformation. And for this, evidence-based, innovative and context-specific solutions are key. We require effective partnerships between research, policy and development to achieve tangible impacts. And CGIAR is an important partner for this, and Germany remains committed to support the one CGIAR. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Felicitas, for giving us that point of view, and we have sort of actually come to an end. So, and I would like to take the opportunity again to thank each and everyone also who has contributed to today's webinar to happen and to encourage again everyone also to contribute into in their sphere of action also in your whatever personal area of responsibility also to do what is needed in a coordinated in a coordinated way to overcome a global food security crisis and to build more resilient agri-food systems also and as we heard particular focus also on the african continent but which is not the only one and keep in mind that this crisis also has a structural and then immediate urgency problem. Yeah, as indicated also earlier, this webinar is part of a series of webinars and we're looking forward to welcome you again to exchange further. Um, this is uh, shall become a forum for exchange. The webinar is recorded. Um, you can listen to it again. Also, we have actually taken note of all the questions that have been posted in different uh, in different channels and forward them to our speakers also so that it is taken into consideration for the further action that we all need to take uh, as as we go now as i said many thanks to all of you and hope to see you very soon again hopefully also on topics that are let's say less emotional for some of us also that but look into a brighter future thank you very much thank you